This presentation is largely drawing from research in my book called The Fruits of Empire. It draws from my third chapter on the watermelon. I have five chapters, one on the grape, orange, watermelon, banana, and pineapple. Um, so we're looking kind of much more closely at this specific research. And given that Thanksgiving is upon us, it's on the horizon, I also have included um, a few minutes at the end of my presentation to think more broadly about how food and race enters into our conversations around the dinner table. In 1887, still life painter, painter Andrew John Henry Way wrote, watermelons are cumbrous and ungraceful, but make very interesting pictorial subjects for representation. Way was right. The watermelon's messy composition and frosty surface make them an ungraceful fruit, but they're also exciting experiments in texture and form for the artist. The fruit's inelegant and delinquent qualities were also used for a darker purpose in the late 19th century, to spread racist claims that African-Americans had a savage appetite for watermelon. Magazine illustrations, silverware signs, paintings, and photographs across high and lowbrow art forms all reproduce the nasty stereotype that African-Americans possessed an insatiable lust for watermelon. The stereotype was so pervasive that it infiltrated all areas of the country. So I found evidence of it in the North, the South, as far West as Hawaii. There's really no region of the country that this racial trope didn't touch. Paintings of watermelons violently stabbed, cut open and bleeding with juice on the contrary, might have served to comment on the violent mistreatment of African-Americans in society. This presentation explores how artists depicted watermelon to address racial stereotypes and violence. This topic is timely to explore with Thanksgiving on the horizon, a holiday which I'll also talk about because it used depictions of food to stimulate similar conversations about race and citizenship. So let's begin by considering the visual history of watermelon. American artists had easy access to this popular fruit, which, which was used in seed spitting contests and 4th of July celebrations. Pittsburgh artist Albert Francis King also displayed the watermelon as a party fruit by showing it engraved with a hole for the injection of alcohol. This square hole known as a plug provided a place for drinkers to spike alcohol directly into the fruit and I hear that this is still a tradition on college campuses today at parties to spike uh, watermelons with alcohol. King painted the plug in a sharp spotlight, cutting the hole in half with a shadow that shows how deep alcohol could descend into the fruit. The slice of watermelon that had been removed from the plug sits on the foreground. Let's see if I can, there's um, an indication of that. And then there's a knife, it's hard to see, lies in the background, having already made the surgical cut. King's still life reflects the vibrant culture of alcohol in his hometown of Pittsburgh, a region influenced by German immigrants who brought with them pretzels, cheese, and their mastery of wine and beer. But not everyone appreciated the marriage of watermelons and alcohol. Temperance supporters urged people to avoid listening to the advocates of a brandy-soaked melon. Say to yourself, such ideas could only emanate from a diseased brain. Artists did little to curb the fruit's association with intemperance. They showed watermelons purging juice, vomiting seeds, soiling tables, foreshadowing what could come from overindulging in a brandy-soaked melon. For etiquette experts who told readers how to meticulously eat watermelon at the table, still life artists showed a failure to follow the rules of polite culture. Watermelons associated with intemperance and a lack of control were used in the late 19th century for making cruel declarations that African-American people had uncontrollable appetites for the fruit. So I wanna insert like a quick trigger warning in here because the next, I'd say like 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna be looking at disturbing imagery, imagery that is just like plainly racist, but I feel it's important to show so that we can confront these images and understand later in the presentation how artists were rejecting or trying to reverse those images. In the last decades of the 19th century, thousands of depictions of watermelon in the Jim Crow era perpetuated this horrific stereotype, including nationwide magazines such as Puck that published Darkie's Day at the Fair, marking one of the only occasions that African-Americans were allowed to visit the Columbian Exposition of 1893, so located in Chicago, where many of you are. 
At this event, watermelons were distributed for free, despite protests by Black committee members who did not want their experiences at the fair to be reduced to such racist associations. The Puck Illustrator depicted people with wide eyes and moist lips eagerly waiting in line to purchase ice cold watermelons. Figures in the illustration sit barefoot and cross-legged on the ground, eating watermelon without silverware or napkins, a signpost meant to indicate that African-Americans were lazy eaters, savagely consuming food without any proper tools. During the rise of the Jim Crow era in the 1880s and 90s, image makers used depictions of watermelon relentlessly to disparage African-Americans. And I use the word relentlessly really purposely here because not only did it stretch across the country, this racial stereotype, but there's really no surface that it didn't touch. I found it in high art, low art, paintings, prints, photographs, advertisements. Um, the, the only word that I can really use to appropriately describe it was relentless. The watermelon trope was not limited to prints. Artist Thomas Hovenden painted a young black man holding a watermelon in a dark interior. It seems the boy has already taken a bite from the fruit since his lips are sparkling with watermelon juice. A spotlight traveling from the boy's lubricated lips to the fleshiness of the watermelon emphasizes his lustful desire for the fruit and the fleshy folds of the female body part that it resembles. Critics remarked on the postcoital tone of the painting, noting how Hovenden loves to paint boys cutting open watermelons or smoking cigarettes and beaming all over with the satisfaction that comes from the gratification of animal desires. Such interpretations advance stereotypes of African-Americans as an excessively sexual people. Hovenden's title also disparaged his sitter by speaking in an imagined voice that displays incompetence with the English language. A magazine article at the time specifically complained about black mispronunciations of the word watermelon, saying, are they not always water millions, millions, or millions? In paintings and prints circulating the country, watermelon became a racial signifier designed to belittle Black people. The watermelon stereotype emerged in the decades after Reconstruction when African Americans had obtained greater civil liberties with emancipation and the abolishment of slavery. The new role of African Americans as citizens produced resentment among many white Americans, specifically those in the South. From advertisements to silverware, portrayals demonized black watermelon eaters as lustful brutes that were intended to undo all the progress of reconstruction by claiming that African Americans were unable to achieve the same standards of intelligence or morality as white Americans. These images communicated that black people were not worthy of citizenship. Reproducing this message in watermelon imagery that spanned a wide variety of media spoke to how urgent many people felt it was to picture African-Americans as an inferior race. So why watermelon? Why did Americans charge the watermelon with this stereotype? Well, the watermelon may have been used to diminish the status of African-Americans because previously, Watermelon symbolized Black independence and a mastery of cultivation. Before the Civil War, African Americans widely cultivated watermelons in slave gardens, one of the few spaces where enslaved people could grow their own food. Cultivating watermelon and African fruit was also a method to maintain connections with African traditions in a country that tried to whitewash African foodways. The Watermelons Association with the Gourd family further associated this fruit with Black agency, since the drinking gourd was a metaphor for the Big Dipper, the constellation that enslaved people used to guide them in traveling north to freedom on the Underground Railroad. So the empowering symbolism of the watermelon before the Civil War became a usable history after the war to disparage Black people. Perhaps this is why so few images from the late 19th century show African Americans actually cultivating the fruit. I'm being very honest with you when I tell you it's so much easier, sadly, to find image after image of African American people eating watermelon. I could hardly find a photograph even of a Black person cultivating the fruit, planting the fruit, harvesting it. Images of Black people planting the fruit would have shown them with too much dignity and horticultural expertise 
and thus betray the disturbing mission of these images to denigrate African Americans. Okay, so I'm always relieved when the first part of this presentation is over. These images are uncomfortable to look at. They're disturbing, like I keep saying. So let's spend um, the next 10 minutes or so talking about how artists may have used the watermelon to reverse or reject some of these images. So at the same time that watermelons were shown lustfully eaten, they were also depicted stabbed, smashed, and bleeding with juice. Still lifes of watermelon arguably display more aggression than other depictions of fruit. The violent nature of watermelon and American still lifes can be traced back earlier in the 19th century when Philadelphia artist Raphael Peel painted a cavernous watermelon with its pink guts carved out from the inside. Decades later, Edward Edmondson painted a ravaged watermelon chewed down to its rind. He glued chunks of glass to his painting creating an unsettling, even dangerous texture. And I always thought this painting was so strange, not just that it includes glass, but I don't know how one even approaches the watermelon and eats it to this degree. These still life paintings show what I call watermelon violence. And they anticipate paintings like The First Cut by painter Robert Spear Dunning, who shows a watermelon pierced by the sharp edge of a knife. For this painting, Dunning edited out the ornate crystal, the glassware for which he was well known, focusing instead on the shallow foreground of the painting where a lump of pink watermelon meat has fallen on the table. The knife does not rest casually. It shoots deep into the tender wound of the fruit, exposing the watermelon's bloody gash. The deepest part of the wound shows the deepest hue of red, resembling the bloody shades of a human cut. The insides of the fruit look fleshy, not watery, further likening Dunning's watermelon to cut skin. In picturing a knife penetrating the flesh of a watermelon, it's possible that Dunning used the fruit to comment on human violence. There were many stories in the late 19th century about the violent consequences of thrusting and splitting open watermelons with sharp knives. One article told of a man who cut a watermelon so violently that he swear he heard the fruit scream murder. Stories of stabbed and severed watermelons specifically evoke the subject of racial violence when the fruit was a constant proxy for African-American people and a staple in racist depictions that made it impossible to separate watermelon from black stereotypes. In evacuating all of the dining room accessories common in his still life paintings, Dunning forced the viewer's attention on the stabbing of this fruit that carried messages about human brutality. The mundane subject of food might have allowed artists like Dunning to visualize topics that were too unsettling or too controversial to depict more overtly. The potential for still life paintings to confront racial violence encourages a reconsideration of watermelon paintings by artist Charles Ethan Porter. Porter, an African-American artist, encountered many obstacles to pursue art professionally. Artists of color and women artists were historically prohibited from studying art in academies or taking life drawing classes to study the human figure. Porter was able to surpass many of these barriers and he was the first African-American artist enrolled at the National Academy of Design in New York. He committed his career to painting still life representations, depicting a wide spectrum of flowers and fruits. But note this, he only ever painted two still life paintings of watermelon over his long career. Okay, this seems deliberate. Why would a black artist wanna paint watermelon, which had been used so frequently in art and visual culture to degrade black people? Perhaps this is why he only paints it twice. When Porter did finally paint watermelon, he did not show it on the polite dining room table under soft, impressionist lighting like many of his other paintings. Instead, Porter showed chunks of watermelon meat torn apart on the ground with wide seeds splattered in the soil like knocked out teeth. The shadow looming over the left side of the picture makes the painting even more ominous. Has someone thrown the watermelon on the ground? Is their presence still lurking? Porter's paintings of cracked, broken watermelons raise similar questions as Dunning's painting of stabbed fruit. No, I found no golden ticket showing that Porter used watermelon to comment on the black condition, but I feel fairly certain that Porter 
a Black artist must have at least considered the implications of painting this fruit, which was so closely attached to racist stereotype. Perhaps this is why, again, he only depicted the fruit twice during his long career, wanting to avoid this charged fruit almost altogether. And know that not only painters were wary of addressing this racially charged fruit, cookbook authors often left out recipes and meals, including watermelon, that is black cookbook authors. So in a time when racist interpretations of watermelon were so ubiquitous, Artists, specifically Black artists and authors, had to cautiously negotiate the subject on canvas and in cookbooks. Now, I'm sad to report that the watermelon stereotype has not died. It has not gone away. It still persists today. And so many contemporary artists have tackled the subject in their work. Artist Carrie Mae Weems, for instance, she created the photograph Black Man Holding Watermelon. She rejected old formulas by showing an older boy looking intelligently at the camera. I mean, he's probably not a boy, he's a man. And he shows no wide eyes, no exaggerated smile of Sitter's past. He stands tall, his height spanning the entire length of the picture plane. And he does not hover over the fruit with grabby hands. He also does not eat the watermelon, but he holds it uncut, refusing to open up the fruit to stereotypical interpretations. Weems also rebuked the misspelled titles of past images that spoke of watermelons or melons that were used to belittle Black people. Her title instead describes the subject plainly and directly, Black man holding watermelon, leaving little room for misinterpretation or derision. Through these visual strategies, Weems rejects stereotypes and charged depictions of watermelons in all ways. I think the greatest success of Weems's photograph is how she makes the viewer acutely aware that this image is carefully staged. So viewers see a sharp spotlight shining on the watermelon and creases in the wrinkled backdrop that clue viewers into the artifice of this photo. Weems does not hide the mechanics of the photographic process. She exposes them to reveal how images have been manipulated and tailored by the maker. She shows how racism operates through visual images while also challenging the very visual images that helped establish racist stereotypes. Now I'm gonna pivot a little bit and use the last 10 minutes of my talk to think beyond watermelon and consider more ways that food has been used to comment on race in this country. This is an especially timely topic given that the Thanksgiving holiday is upon us. And did you know that Thanksgiving only became a federal holiday in 1864? Okay, this was a major milestone considering that there had only been two approved national holidays before this, George Washington's birthday and Independence Day. Thanksgiving was widely celebrated in the colonial period and it has been mythologized as an event of union and peace between Native Americans and pilgrims, which is a total myth that I could spend another hour, an entire presentation, an entire seminar deconstructing for you. But uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I want to consider how the status of this holiday as a federal holiday in 1864 was actually inspired by the Civil War over slavery and desires of Abraham Lincoln to unite the North and South during wartime. Abolitionists in the North used the Thanksgiving holiday as an opportunity to preach the evils of slavery and to celebrate its elimination. In an article from the New York Daily Tribune, the author thanks God that slavery is dead. In his words, the abolition of slavery is the supreme Thanksgiving of the year. Illustrations of Thanksgiving after the Civil War continue to take on a tone of racial uplift. Thomas Nass picture for Harper's Weekly entitled Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving Dinner shows a Thanksgiving feast shared among a diversity of eaters. So we see Europeans, Asian immigrants, as well as African-Americans at the table. The corners of the illustration announced, come one, come all, and free and equal. Thanksgiving was used to celebrate the diversity of the United States proclaiming every American's right to a Thanksgiving meal, the ultimate exercise in citizenship. Although the people of color in this image are still rendered according to stereotype 
and they are not given as much dignity or individualization as white eaters at the table. Thanksgiving dinner here was the ultimate badge of citizenship and used to represent a utopian vision of a diverse United States where everyone was accepted at the table. Even knowing that this holiday celebrated emancipation and equality for many, there are still uneven power structures embedded in the very foods that we eat over the Thanksgiving holiday. So I have friends in the South, for instance, they eat fried turkey, collard greens, black eyed peas for Thanksgiving. These dishes are better known as Southern food, Southern cuisine, a cuisine made popular by chefs like Paula Dean, Emeril, and others who have built restaurants, cookbooks, and lucrative empires around Southern food. But let me tell you something, this is not actually Southern food. What I described is Southern African American food, also known as soul food, whose chefs get little credit in comparison to white Southern chefs. Unlike Southern food, um, soul food has not historically been considered a scientific or modern genre of cooking. It instead has been portrayed as a mystical practice in which cooks rely on one's smell and one's senses to cook from the soul rather than from a standardized recipe. Now, I don't doubt that soul food chefs use their intuition when cooking and probably don't require a standardized recipe when making food, but this emphasis on the mystical qualities of soul food are used to perpetuate stereotypes that black food is unscientific and thus less intelligently or deliberately made. Equally disturbing is that soul food has been appropriated by white Southern chefs and renamed Southern food and little credit has been given to the black cooks, servants and people throughout history who mastered the techniques and ingredients that Southern food was built upon. Culinary historian, Michael Twitty tries to correct the cultural appropriation of black food in the cooking gene, which he established in 2011. His project and his goal was to examine food histories from Africa and the Americas to the unknown black cooks and servants who made Southern food what it is today. He's trying to spotlight a history that has since been lost or obscured. And so he visits several places in the South to conduct genealogical and genetic research to rediscover African food heritage. And food is indeed like humans that have genealogical histories and ancestral roots. He calls this project the Southern Discomfort Tour and recently exposed that the Jack Daniels whiskey recipe was originally invented by black enslaved people who worked in distilleries. Twitty fights the invisibility of black voices in Southern cooking. He says that white chefs receive all the attention and there are only a few token black cooks and chefs being called to speak on Southern food. He says, we are surrounded by culinary injustice where some Southerners take credit for things that enslaved Africans and their descendants played key roles in innovating. He writes to Chef Paula Dean in a letter from 2013, the Southern, oh, excuse me, the Southern foods eaten at our table, at our Thanksgiving table were made largely in the hands of enslaved cooks who prepared food on your ancestors' Georgia plantation. In short, you can't talk about Southern cooking without talking about the African slave trade. He says, your barbecue is my West African babic. Your fried chicken, your red rice, your hoe cake, your watermelon, your black eyed peas, your crowder peas, your musk melon, your tomatoes, your peanuts, your hot peppers, your Brunswick stew and okra soup, Benny, jambalaya, hop and john gumbo, stewed greens and fat meat, have inextricable ties to the plantation South and it's often black majority coming from strong roots in West Africa and Central Africa. He writes, there's an unwillingness to give African-American barbecue masters and other cooks an equal chance at the platform. So I'll close my presentation with Twitty's words. I encourage you to think about where your foods come from this Thanksgiving. What traditions do you draw upon for this meal? Who historically invented these foodways? How can you credit or give back to the people whose foodways you enjoy so much at the table? I love the idea that food and its representation can be a form of resistance 
and reconciliation. Because as much as food has been used to divide or denigrate people, it can also be used to fight inequalities and to bridge cultures. From watermelon to turkey, food and its visual representation hits the nerve of the nation's most heated debates. Thank you so much for listening. Again, I look forward to your feedback. <laughs> and let me do a quick plug because my press will get mad at me if I don't. <laughs> I have this book out, The Fruits of Empire. It is my baby, it is my everything. And unfortunately, books are tragically expensive in the academic world. So if you are so inclined to pay for it, please use this discount code or I can send it to you and know that all of my royalties are being donated to the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So they are a civil rights organization to help support and improve the condition for farm workers in the United States.